A very good morning to you. I'm Howard Feldman. This is the Sunday Synthesis Podcast with me, Howard Feldman, and of course, uh, expert physician pulmonologist, Dr. Anton Marburg. Well, 2021 has gotten off to a ridiculous start. The Americans have lost whatever was left of their dignity. South Africa never had any, so we're kind of okay in that regard. If we thought we were going to miss the second wave, well, uh, those hopes are out the window, and we are now in the midst of what can only be called a crisis, a uh, terrible situation, a very difficult one, but uh, we're going to hear from the expert. Thank you, everybody, for all of your questions that you've sent in. They cover, uh, there's, there's certain themes that, of course, we want to get through and that, that you've asked us to cover a lot about the medication, a lot about the vaccines, a lot about lockdown and returning to normal. That's why we have Dr. Anton Marburg with us. Uh, Anton, very, very good morning to you. Just to, uh, just to give our, our listeners and our viewers a bit of perspective, uh, you came back from your holiday last week, Monday. It's uh, six days uh, since you've been back in the trenches. How has it been? So, good morning to everybody. Yeah, I came back from holiday last week, Sunday, and uh, got back into the battle trenches early Monday morning. And I basically haven't left those trenches since Monday morning, uh, the start of this week. It's an absolute battlefield here. It's catastrophic, it's cataclysmic. You can say whichever synonym you want to say, but it's absolutely disastrous. And it's a true pandemic that we're in at the moment. This second wave is far worse than the first wave that we had. And that's on many levels, on many levels from a hospital point of view, from a patient point of view, from a patient number point of view, from the hours spent in hospital, from the hours treating patients, from the de degree of severity of illness of the patients. It's just absolutely unplayable. We are seeing multiple hospitals that are filling up. We're seeing hospitals that are not having enough ventilators, having to use anesthetic machines from the surgical theaters to ventilate patients. Hospitals like Steve Biko having bring up tents outside the hospital to treat other patients. So it's really a disaster at this point in time, and we really are in, in major trouble. If we look at the world stats, we are currently 90,139,155 cases worldwide, with 1,935,981 deaths, and that's just gone up to 982. Um, 64 million cases resolved. The United States has 22 million cases with 381,000 deaths. And South Africa is sitting at 1,214,176 cases with 32,824 deaths and 21,606 new cases in the last 24 hours. Gauteng has 4,033 cases in hospital with COVID-19 at the moment, with 844 in ICU and 252 being ventilated. And the test positivity rate at the moment is 28%. Um, the active cases is about over 200,000. The majority of the new cases we're seeing are coming from KwaZulu-Natal. That's about 30% of the cases. About 26% of the cases are coming from Gauteng and 12% from Western Cape. So overall, it's quite a grim picture that we're seeing. And there's, there's major havoc, anarchy, chaos throughout the country. In terms of what you're seeing, um, in terms of numbers at the hospital that you're at, now compared to the, the peak of the first wave, um, how does that compare? Look, it's a, it's a completely different ball game if we can use that analogy. But I mean, during the first wave, this was something new. And this was something that we didn't know about and was something we didn't expect. And we thought it was so bad. But had we have known what would be coming in the second wave, we would have really relaxed during that first wave. I mean, the numbers are just dramatic in hospital at the moment. In, in my hospital, we've got a full ICU, 25 patients in the ICU itself that are COVID positive, all requiring major ventilation or some type of ventilation. They're all extremely ill. We've got multiple wards that are full with patients. We've got over 85 COVID patients, minimal elective patients with other diseases. The wards are full, the hospital's full, people are fatigued. People are exhausted. We seeing a totally different spread of disease amongst people compared to the first wave. In the first wave, there was a lot of elderly people over the age of 65, 75 in hospital. We've now got a major sort of complement of people between the age of 45 to 55 
that we didn't have before. Also, during the first wave, we found it was mainly Caucasians that we were seeing in hospital. Now it's Caucasians and non-Caucasians. It's above board. It's across the board. It's very widespread. It doesn't matter where you come from, what area this disease is affecting people. In ter- and, and in terms of what you're seeing with regard to the new strain or the new variant, it, do you is this something that you even bother to check? Uh, because does it make no. a difference? Or, or is this something that's important? You know, to you? It, it, it's academic in one sense. And, and I'll say why well, I'm saying in one sense, because with regards to vaccine, it's a different story. But for us in a hospital setting, it's academic. We're seeing sick people, regardless what type of variant it is, it's the same type of treatment. So the treatment doesn't change whether it's variant A or variant B, whether it's variant 5Y01 or B1 or Z, or whatever the actual variant is, the treatment doesn't change. The difference is that it's a more, more transmissible disease. Now, some of the academics are saying that it's it's not more severe, but we definitely see more severe cases. There's no, there's no doubt about it. On a clinical side of, of the things, the cases are much more severe and they are much sicker and they're getting much sicker earlier on. So when I said from the second point of view, we don't know about the vaccine, whether or not it will cover the new variant. But I did see last night that Pfizer said that they believe that it will cover the new variant. Right, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the vaccines in just a moment. When you and I chatted last night, you, you, you gave me some insight into what your day looks like. And uh, it, it really bothered me, it upset me, it perplexed me. And, and I would like you to share, I know this is not something that you would ordinarily do. Um, you know, and, and, and in fact, it's, it's very interesting because we've seen a shift in how doctors and how medical personnel are actually talking to people outside of this because their behavior now becomes important. Whereas in the past, you would just put your head down, do what you had to do, and that was the end of that. But but when you described to me how long it takes you to get through a a ward round and the fact that you can't drink or or, or stop for a moment because that means breaking the seal and maybe having to shower, just take us through, excuse me, some of that. So it's quite a complicated thing. If if I discuss what happened yesterday, you know, at this point in time, it's impossible to work by yourself as a doctor. You need to have a buddy doctor, someone who works with you, that you both, there's two minds thinking about what's going on, two people deciding and making decisions. So in that sense, it's actually very good because you've got two brains for one patient. So for myself, I work with my partner, Dr. Karen Zinman. We work together. We've got a buddy system and we transcribe. We, we, we examine the patients together and we make decisions together and we see every single patient. Yesterday, we started our ward rounds at six o'clock going into PPE. That means you're putting on the gown, you're putting on the apron, you're putting on another gown, you're putting on three sets of gloves, you're sitting on an N95 mask, you've got your glasses on, you've got a visor on. We stayed in those outfits from six o'clock until about half past two yesterday afternoon doing our first ward round of the day, going through all the patients from ICU, going through all the regular wards and et cetera, seeing everybody there. You cannot eat, you cannot drink, you cannot fiddle with your glasses, you cannot fiddle with your mask. So you basically are fasting for that period of time. You are dehydrating. It's a very hot, humid, clammy environment that you're working in. So it's a very hard, difficult environment to be in. And it's not a simple, simple thing. By the end of that sort of uh, that shift where you, where you get to go take off your PP and go and shower, you are exhausted, you are dehydrated, and uh, there's still lots more of that to go. So, so this morning, for example, you would have started your round very, very early. Uh, you made an exception in that you stopped to, to shower so that we could do this podcast. Is that right? So this morning, I managed to start my round a bit earlier, even earlier than, than, than six this morning, so that I could make that exception. I'm not even halfway through my round at the moment. Um, what we've done is we've, we've covered the major ICU patients and the extremely ill patients. And then after the podcast, I'll carry on with the rest of the patients. In the interim, my partner is seeing the other patients. Right. And uh, just for, for anyone uh, who, you know, you'll be watching this a little bit later, it's now around about quarter past 11 in the morning. So that's, that's just gives you an indication. And I thought that was important to talk about just how difficult this is. 
and and what and and uh, what you're going through at the hospitals. Let's just now start talking about some of the major concerns that people have have sent us. And I'm not going to necessarily go through everybody's question because there are groups of questions, and a lot of you are asking exactly the same thing. Let's start and talk about the treatment. Um, we know there's been a lot of conversations about ivermectin. You and I spoke about it at, at, at our last podcast, which was uh, just before the new year. Um, there have been further studies that have come out about that. Where are we in terms of South Africa and what are we doing in terms of, of treatment? If you can just take us through that, that would be very helpful. So I think it's very important. And, and you've made a good point that where are we in terms of South Africa? And that's where we are. We are in South Africa. So we have to follow the law related to us by the South African government and by the South African Health Professions Regulatory Authority. That's called SARPRA. SARPRA have made it illegal for us to prescribe ivermectin on a number of levels, okay? In fact, yesterday, a hospital in Durban, one of the pharmacists was allegedly prescribing ivermectin and they were arrested. So it is illegal to prescribe ivermectin in South Africa at this point in time. And I say at this point in time because medicine is a very changeable sort of profession things do change. If peer-reviewed studies do come out and things are right, then they will change things to make things better and different. At this point in time, we still know that ivermectin is a drug used to treat parasites in animals and treat certain tropical diseases in humans that we don't see in South Africa, okay? It's registered here to treat cows in veterinary diseases, okay? It is not registered for humans. But as I said, that can change in the future. We know these things do change. And, you know, at any time, there could be a development of a Section 21, which is a special dispensation to actually use the medication. But that will only be allowed once SARPRA give us right. the go-ahead to use that. So I There's been that. many I, reports here. I, yeah. I get the whole legal side of it. But what are you seeing in terms of the effect, uh, the, the success? It, or lack of success that people so, are having. So that's, the, that's the whole point. That's the whole point is, first of all, it's a drug that's not being used in isolation in certain places. And it's not being used everywhere. I've spoken to my colleagues in the United States. I've spoken to my colleagues in Israel. None of them are using it either. Okay, So there's small groups that are using it and there's big groups that aren't using it. Okay? And the studies vary with respect to whether it's been used in an outpatient, whether it's been used in an inpatient, whether it's been used in ICU. Also, whether it's used in isolation. It's being used with corticosteroids. It's being used with, um, with anticoagulation. It's been used with interleukin-6 inhibitors. So how do you tell that this drug is actually working if it hasn't been isolated or randomized properly? You need a trial where it's randomized properly, and the trials that have been done so far are essentially poor, and they're not superior to placebo. Now, though there's many companies and there's many groups that are going to say that, you know, we're just going to dispel the alvamectin. I'm not dispelling alvamectin. I'm saying to you, Give us more studies. Give us more proof that it works, and then we will start using it. But at this point in time, it is not the miracle cure for COVID-19. Which is so confusing because my, my Facebook says that it is. Is that the Facebook that tells you to use that cream to grow the hair on your head? Yeah, well, that didn't work. But that but, seems to be working. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's a little rude. Wow, somebody needed to get a drink before they started this podcast, talk about dehydration and irritability. Sure. So uh, I, I think the truth is the matter yeah. is that, I, I've said this all along, we're not withholding medication. We yeah. want people to get better. We are desperate to get people better. But where we stand at this point, the ICU Collaboration Group of South Africa, together with SAPRA, together with all our colleagues, are not advocating the use of ivermectin. That might change in the future, but today the 10th of January, 2021, we are not yet advocating the use if we were advocated at all. Right. Okay, so what treatments are we currently using? What do you have in your arsenal? Okay, so that much hasn't changed very much dramatically. We're still using the vitamin concoctions. And we've said that multiple times, that your vitamin C, your thiamine, your nicotinamide, your zinc, your vitamin D, your calciferol, that's your basic group. Other drugs added to that are your your statins, your colchicine, and a whole host of other drugs. Now, for actual treatment of patients who are somebody who's on oxygen, who's got low saturation, we're using corticosteroids, which we've been using for a number of months, as well as because it's a hypercoagulable disease. In other words, it's a disease caused clotting, strokes, heart attacks. We're using anticoagulation, blood thinners, and in certain people that are in a 
in an environment where there's aerosolization, where people are wearing N95 masks and are protected, there we are using nebulizers. But that's only in a place where the people are right. properly dressed, wearing proper PPE, and there's different types of nebulizations we're using. We also do use, at sort of in, in rare cases, drugs like tocilizumab, which is an interleukin-6 inhibitor, which we've been using for a number of months. There are studies coming out saying it's a very successful drug. We've got limited success data with it, and we use it late in the disease some people have had success, others haven't. There's still all the other therapies that are being touted, such as uh, monoclonal antibodies, convalescent plasma, and a whole host of other things. But the, the be-all and end-all for us is obviously the vaccines. Mm-hmm. So let's move on, on to that. Um, we, we had a very scary few weeks where it didn't look like the South African government was getting it together. Then they formed a, um, what seems to be a very, very impressive group of people. And already we've had an announcement that at least medical professionals will be receiving vaccines with, within the next few weeks. That must be tremendously positive news. That is very, that is very positive news. I must, I must say, you know, we are working on the front line. We are putting ourselves at risk. And yes, it's a chosen profession. And yes, we chose to do that. But we need to remain healthy in order to look after people. So it's about time that the government has stepped up and is doing something like this. And the vaccine that they're looking to bring is the AstraZeneca vaccine, which, which is an outsourced vaccine, which has been outsourced to the Serum Institute of India that is going to be providing the vaccine to South Africa. Um, it's a very friendly vaccine from the fact that it can be kept uh, temperature stable at between two to eight degrees, unlike the mRNA vaccines such as the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. It's a replication of a defective adenovirus that gets basically injected into the body and then infects the cell DNA, but it doesn't modify the actual gene. So it, it causes, it produces the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the body, which the body actually causes an immune response against, and that's how you fight the virus from that. So it's more the classic type of vaccine that we've been given our entire lives, really. Very similar to that, yes. Mm-hmm. Is there, is there and concern? it's a double vaccine. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a single vaccine. As I erroneously mentioned a few weeks ago, it's a double vaccine. So it's right. two, you need two jabs of the AstraZeneca one. Uh, are you more comfortable with that type of a vaccine, or are you sort of holding back on your thoughts about some of the Look, uh, at this point in time, I think we'll take what we can get. You know, <laughs> if we've got the Pfizer one, we take the Pfizer one. If we've got the Moderna one, we take the Moderna one. So whatever you can um, get. We, you. We're very happy with the Astra, AstraZeneca one because that was done in the Chadox, you know, uh, trial. And that has been tested on South Africans. It's been tested on people with HIV. It's been tested on a whole host of people. So we're hoping that this will be able to fight the variant uh, with the, the new strain of the, of the, of the virus. And, and we'll take it all from there. But it is a very positive step forward. How long does it take for the vaccine to actually become effective if you have it on the 1st of February? So if you have it the 1st of February, a few weeks later, you have the booster. Already your body within two or three weeks starts making antibodies from it. You get your memory B cells and your your T cells, which start working. And within a week or two after that, that second or after the booster, you should be able to have a nice immunity from that vaccine. Remember, and I think this is a crucial point, a vaccine does this vaccine does not cure SARS-CoV-2. So it does not cure the virus, but it helps prevent transmissibility. It helps with herd immunity and it helps making people less sick if they actually get the virus. It's the same as the flu vaccine in the sense that people always think, well, I've had the flu vaccine. How did I get the flu? You got the flu because you got a much milder version of the flu. Whereas, regards, if you hadn't had the flu vaccine, you would have got a much more severe flu and potentially end up in hospital. And that's the whole purpose of this vaccine, is to make a much milder form of virus that your body can deal with, that you don't need to be in hospital and you won't get as sick. So somebody, Susan, for example, uh, sent a question saying she lives in Israel, she's had the vaccine. Is it safe for her then to travel to South Africa, let's say a month later? So the truth is, there's many unanswered questions. You know, we're all in the infancy of the vaccines now. And there's a few questions you've got to ask. Is it safe? Most likely it will be safe. Okay, But can you transmit, even though you had the vaccine, can you transmit it to other people? And there's a potential that you can. That's the whole thing. As I said, it doesn't cure the virus. So you can still transmit it because you can still get the virus. So it's still a worry that, that you can transmit virus to other people and make them sick. So 
there are lots of unanswered open-ended questions that we're dealing with at the moment. Is that why people will still be wearing masks um, even after they've had this vaccine? Yeah, because once again, you need herd immunity. Remember, we've said herd immunity is 70% of the population needs to be immunized against the SARS-CoV-2 infection or have decreased infections from it. And, and the way things are going at the moment with viral transmission of people returning back to work or behavioral adaptations in their lifestyles, people are trying to find a normal way of contact. Uh, this virus continues to circulate. So we can't stop that at the moment to, until we get the national or evolution of the herd immunity from the vaccine. There are going to be new variants. They're more transmissible. There are going to be other strains. And we need everyone to be vaccinated so we can prevent it spreading. And until that time, we are going to have to wear masks. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a country like Israel that are preparing to vaccinate the whole country, that's a different, different topic completely. You know, because if you can vaccinate the whole country, then you've reached herd immunity. Mm. I'm fascinated by the figure that, that's been thrown around and we, we mentioned it on the podcast a few weeks ago that the new variant is 70% more um, transmissible how do we know that? How, how do they determine that figure? Look, a lot of these tests are done in vitro which is done in a lab okay? and the tests are done they see what type of strain it is what type of virus it is but we're seeing the spread, the way it's spreading now and how quickly it's spreading. Remember, we look at the r naught number, the number of people that are infected mm. from one person. And that also gives us an answer of how it spread from one person to another. We look at the super spreading events. We look at the population spread. We look at the peaks and plateaus in different areas. And that tells us how it's so much more transmissible and how much more effective the virus yeah. is. All right. I'd, I'd like to also spend a moment talking about behavior because certainly I'm hearing lots of stories about uh, people within Johannesburg that are traveling back from whether it's Cape Town, Platte. I've heard about people that have actually got on airplanes, um, either knowing that they are COVID positive or, or think or suspecting they might, uh, it might be. Uh, what do we do about that? Are we meant to be naming and shaming? I, I, I don't intend doing that on the podcast, but what do we do about that? You know, you need to have a responsibility as a human being to protect each other. That's our responsibility. You know, so many people and too many people think that it's okay to get on an airplane when you're positive, and it's not, because that's how you spread the virus to people. Because people are going to Johannesburg, people are going to Cape Town, people are going to other areas, and you keep on spreading. It is selfish to get on an airplane if you are feeling sick or if you know you're COVID or you've got SARS-CoV-2 because the chances of you spreading it are very high. We know it's got a high transmissibility. So should we be naming and shaming? Possibly. Do you want to be the name and shamer? No, you don't want to be the name no. and shamer, but should we be doing it? Yeah, mm -hmm. we should be. We need people to actually take responsibility and we need medical professionals. We need non-medical professionals, people to actually step up to the game and actually start playing the game properly. Are, are, are medical professionals that aren't, uh, let's say, in, in, in your specific area of pulmonology or, or, uh, or, or COVID-related, is there a, a desire or is there a call for them to, 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 to raise their hands and say, look, I happen to be, a, I don't know, an ophthalmologist or, or whatever it would be. It's not my field, but can I help? Uh, is, is this something that would be helpful for the hospitals? You know, anyone who's a doctor knows how to examine somebody's chest, whether you are an orthopedic surgeon, whether you're a general surgeon, whether there's anything you can add to help the load. Mainly the hospitals are being run by physicians. Some hospitals have got physicians and anesthetists, but the physicians, pulmonologists, ICU specialists are taking the brunt and the load of the running of this. So other doctors, some doctors are offering help, um, mainly the cardiologists, but other anesthetists are offering help. And certain other doctors are offering the expertise. Some of the surgeons are offering help in putting in lines and helping with that type of thing. But the more help, the better. There's no reason why a non-physician can can't come and help up? examine a patient. Hypochondriacs, can we step up? We know a lot. We probably know a lot more than a lot of you guys. There, there's no know. way a hypochondriac can step up. You'll be out of breath by the time you get on the first step. It's true. It is true. It is true. Certainly this one. I've got my own oximeter. I mean, I, I can bring my equipment. Thermometers, oximeter. I mean, I've got the stuff. We're happy for you to stay in your little bubble at home. 
All right, fine. I'll keep doing then what I uh, keep. Uh, I'll keep doing what I'm doing. All right. To taking a look at some of the other questions, um, is the uh, Lana wants to know is the National COVID app reliable? Should one download it? I can tell you, I've downloaded it. I didn't have. Uh, I've had uh, very little. Um, I've had no exposure. A friend of mine tells me he's getting alerts every 15 minutes, no matter where he is. Uh, is it working? So I'd say I haven't downloaded it for the sole reason that if I don't know it, my phone, my phone battery will die. If I'm seeing yeah. 85 COVID patients a day, the mm. phone's going to be alerting every second of the day, remembering that I'm in PPE and protected, but it then alerts things. So, you know, I think that's a personal opinion. I have heard that it is working for certain people. I don't think it's a bad thing to do, but that's a decision you've got to make on your own. Right. Okay. Another question is, and, and we're going to come back to, people returning domestic workers, uh, um, exposing your domestic worker to, let's say if you've been to Cape Town or one of the hotspots, Fazul and Natal, exposing your domestic worker and vice versa. So in fact, let, let, let's answer that question right now. Uh, we as a family come back from, I don't know, KwaZulu and Natal, we've been in a hotspot area. Um, what do, how, how do we protect each other? So look, I mean, you know, the, the, you gotta be very careful. You know, I mean, ideally, the first prize would be not to fly home, it would be to drive home. That's really one way to protect people. But if you do fly, once again, mask, visors, don't eat on the plane, don't take your mask off, don't drink, just get through the flight and get home. Okay? If you are coming home and your domestic is at home and you haven't been in contact, then wear masks around each other and don't mm -hmm. interact with each other the whole time. But if you've been to a hot spot, if you've been to a funeral at a hot spot area, then you've got to isolate. Then you've got to stay away from people because you've got to quarantine yourself. And I'm talking about domestics or non-domestics. It's far more prudent to protect yourselves now than have to worry about it 11 days later, knowing you've been exposed and have to go into a quarantine and worry about getting infected from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Someone asked a great question. If we have antibodies, which we've confirmed with an actual blood test from a corona strain that we had in, in August, let's say 2020, what does this mean in terms of the new strains? It means absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing, unfortunately, because we're seeing reinfections. So we don't know that those antibodies are protecting you against the strain. So where we're standing at the moment, you take it that although you might have antibodies, and also you've got to know how high the antibodies are. You know, there's a new study that's come out that was discussing the working of the B cells and the T cells, and they may last for eight, six to eight months. That may be all good and true, but we don't know how this fits in with the new variants of COVID. Does it affect you? Does it protect you? Are you going to be formulating new antibodies and new neutralizing antibodies to defeat this virus? So if you had the virus in August and you did have antibodies, it doesn't mean now in January, over three months later, that you are safe and that you won't get the virus again. Right, because lots of questions. If you've recently had COVID, Jocelyn wants to know, and have antibodies and are then exposed to the virus, um, must you isolate again? Yes, because once again, it's very similar to the vaccine. We don't know if you can still transfer. We don't know if your body's neutralizing that, that virus with antibodies or making only antibodies to fight it itself. There's still a chance that you can transfer the virus to other people, and that's why you have to quarantine. Right. Lots and lots of questions around that. Um, would any, uh, Amir wants to know what medical history would exclude a person from having the vaccine? Are there any? So there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of infancy of the vaccines. Re at this point, would we give it to pregnant women? It's unlikely because none of the studies have been done on pregnant women. So that we wouldn't give it to pregnant women at this moment. It's not the Pfizer vaccine is not being used in children under the age of 16. The Moderna one's not being used in children under the age of 18. There's a lot of controversy about rheumatological patients because a lot of them are immune suppressants. And that you've got to discuss with the rheumatologists. Most of them are safe to be used in rheumatological diseases. Most of the vaccines are safe to be used in people who've had Guillain Barre syndrome. The only issues that we're seeing at the moment, and we're seeing this with the Pfizer and the Moderna, is that there are about 0.2% of the population getting anaphylaxis from the vaccine. And that means that's an allergic reaction. And that's why they're saying when you have the vaccine, you've got to stay in that place for 20 to 30 minutes so you can be observed to make sure there's no allergic reaction from the vaccine. 
obviously yeah. you've had a previous reaction to a vaccine or you've had previous allergies suffering from vaccines or medications, you need to make your healthcare professional aware so they know what to look out for. Anonymous says, if a person coming from overseas and has had the vaccine, is it safe to stay with me as if I have comorbidities or should they isolate for a few days first with someone who does not? Well, I think we've answered that. We said because mm -hmm. we don't know that they can transmit the virus or not. Mm -hmm. So better to isolate for a few days first. Right. And also, uh, if someone's had the vaccine, they're only just getting the second booster now. So they won't really have had the, the antibody desired effect we want yet. Right. Can we just talk for a moment about schools? Lots of questions about that. Uh, you're saying that, that uh, we're not going to be giving the vaccine to kids under 16. The reality is that we're not going to be getting the vaccine before the kids have got to go back to school in any event. Private schools, I know a lot of them have postponed going back. I meant to start this week. At, at the moment, they're scheduled to go back next week. Uh, do you think that's likely to happen? And is it safe? I think so. I, I hope so. I, I do think it's safe. I think the whole purpose of delaying the kids going back to school for another week is A, to keep it in lines with the governmental schools and B, also to quarantine people who've come back from holiday, to give them a chance to stay indoors so that they are manifesting bars, they can stay indoors and not spread it to other people. Remember, we've said this all along, the safest place for a child to be is in school. They're in their bubble in school, they're socially distanced, they're wearing their masks, they're well protected, they, the rooms are well aired, and we found that the spread of virus is negligible at school. In fact, last year we had minimal, if any, cases spread at school. So it's a much safer environment. And we want our kids to go back to school. We're desperate for our kids to go back to school. That being said, that doesn't depend on you and me and anybody else other than the president. If the president speaks on the 15th and he says we can't go back to school, well, then we can't go back to school. Mm -hmm. But we're hoping we will allow the kids to go back to school. What's your thoughts on, on uh, prayer and, uh, and uh, uh, faith-based gatherings? So I don't see an issue in a faith-based gathering or a prayer session that's done correctly. If you've got 20 people that are well-spaced out, that are wearing their masks, I can't see why that's any different to someone going to school in a well-spaced out area. As long as you're taking people that don't have comorbidities and people who aren't elderly and you're doing it the way it was done before this lockdown, I don't see why it should be a problem. Mm, mm. And, and, and Laura says, I went for an antibody test. I was negative. Does that mean I have no immunity at all? Um, so uh, my son has had COVID. Um, I've been exposed to it. Does that mean that you just don't have... Uh, so, uh, no, immunity. so what it means is no, what finding... saying is, and it's actually an interesting question. I didn't understand it when she was first saying it, but she's saying, I've been taking vitamins. I've been doing all of this stuff. If Would I have um, immunity? Would you be able to see it in that test? So the, we find that 30% of people who test for the antibodies come back as negative. And that's a whole host of reasons. Some people don't have the immune response. Some people aren't fighting. Some people who have come back as, as COVID positive, it was a false positive. And it wasn't actually a positive test. And they thought they were exposed. They weren't exposed. But some people just don't mount that immune response. It depends on how bad the virus was that you were exposed to in the first place. Once again, also, I've said this many a time, you know, there are other coronaviruses. And we know that over the years, people get exposed to those and they might have had antibodies from those. And that's why you have a mountain immune response to this. So there can be many reasons for that. It doesn't mean that you, there's something wrong with you, that you've got an immune deficiency problem. Because if you did, you would have, you would have mounted sort of um, any problems many years before this. Right. Okay. Interesting. The, uh, and, and let's just go through that, that vitamin regime that I know we keep doing this, but I do think it's important. Uh, somebody who is well, taking care of themselves, uh, which vitamin should they be taking on a daily basis? So vitamin C, zinc, definitely on a daily basis. If you are sick, then it's vitamin C, it's zinc, it's thiamine, it's um, calciferol, and it's nicotinamide. That's the vitamin grouping that we use together. And that's the best way to, to, try, and remain, to try and remain healthy. Yeah, you, know, you can also take other vitamins. I mean, the, the, more, the more vitamins you take, the more you're going to urinate out. So, you know, it's unlikely they, they're going to harm you. But you can take your effervescent vitamins. You can take your multivitamins. Those are also good for you, and they keep your immunity up. 
as I said before, many a time that we don't generally advocate vitamins, but in this time, we definitely are. Mm -hmm. And how far do you think we are, let's say in Gauteng, from the peak of the second wave? I think wave? that in the next two weeks, we are hitting the peak of the second wave. You know, a lot of people are coming back from, from their holidays. Uh, we've seen the numbers going up dramatically, over 21,000 you know, new cases, it's, it's coming soon. And, and, you know, it can take a number of weeks for that to plateau. So we're going to be in a spiral for the number of coming weeks. And we really just have to be careful and we have to be responsible that, and we have to be number, responsible and we have to be responsible. Yeah. That number of 21,000, how long does it take um, for those numbers to, obviously for somebody to be tested, to receive the results, for those results to be sent to government and for, for us to receive them. In other words... So first of all, those numbers go to the NRCD, the National Institute of Communicable Diseases, okay? They are the body that's actually forming this and watching this and giving us our numbers regarding this. Now, if you tested yesterday and you only get your result on Wednesday, then on Wednesday, the result comes back as positive and that goes into that testing for them. So it doesn't necessarily mean for that day, it's based in the last two or three days and that's when the result comes out. So it means the positive result on that day. Right, so it actually could mean that the what we're seeing is is really three or four days back of testing in reality. And that's why on the weekends, generally on a Sunday, Monday, the numbers are generally lower because it's less testing happens over the weekends. Mm -hmm. All right, interesting. And and uh, do you think that we're going to stick to this uh, to this level, or is or can it go higher than the twenty one thousand? I mean, this is way above Look, I mean, what we were. I think, it, I think it could go up a bit higher still. Okay, we expect it to go up a bit higher. Hopefully not dramatically higher. Hopefully people are now starting to get the picture that this is a dramatic, yes. dramatic virus that we're dealing with. And, and how are you coping? You've told us about your last week. It's only been a week since you're back. How are you managing? So it's a battle. I mean, I don't know any other words to say it. I mean, I have to, uh, at this stage, just... Uh, send my love to my family, to my wife and to my children who I'm barely seeing at the moment. I mean, you know, they always say the people on the front line are the real heroes. We're not the heroes. My family are the heroes. They've got to put up with me. They've got to put up with us. They've got to put up with not seeing us, with living their lives alone and not being able to have their father and their family or their mother and their family. That's a very difficult thing. And it's very hard for them. So I'm sending much love to them because this is the form and the way that I get to see them. <laughs> which is just more than a little tragic, but uh, keep doing the work that you are doing. Um, everybody on the front lines uh, absolutely doing God's work. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? So, yes. Okay, there is definitely light. We, we, we're definitely seeing good things happening. The waiting for the vaccine rollout is over. We're now coming to the end of that wait, and we expect it to get vaccine, even if it's just for healthcare workers. It's a start. We've got to start somewhere. So that's coming in the next few weeks. The peaks are coming down in the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape, another positive thing. The world is buzzing with different medications, different treatments, different vaccines, and we are going to beat this pandemic. And called, speaking about beating something, Liverpool smashed Aston Villa in the third round of the FA Cup. So we're going to win this. We have to win this. And to quote, we must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. Be safe, be well, look after yourself so we can look after you, so we can look after each other. We've got a job to do. We've got to look after each other as human beings and as people so that other people don't get sick. Be safe, keep your distance, wash your hands, wear your masks, and be responsible. Dr. Anton Marburg, thank you. As always, Godspeed to you. Uh, just keep safe, and uh, we'll hopefully chat to you either during the week or we will uh, certainly chat to you next Sunday. This is the Sunday Synthesis Podcast with me, Howard Feldman. Subscribe to the YouTube channel below so that you can get the latest updates. We do this every Sunday and uh, have been doing it since March, around about March, in fact, uh, maybe even a little earlier last year. But we do, from time to time, get together if there's important information to be able to share that with you. I'm Howard Feldman. Be safe and God bless.